Anyway, so uh, I built this talk as a, a history of medical physics, uh, but really when I got down to it, I realized that I could only focus on the early history. There's really too much, uh, too detailed, and frankly too awesome uh, stuff to just skip over. So hope you guys don't mind. I don't leave, I don't go past the 1920s. So uh, today is November 7th, which is the International Day of Medical Physics, uh, according to the IOMP. Uh, this is one of the posters on the IOMP website. I don't know what this is supposed to mean. It doesn't kind of give any information about what Medical Physics Day is or what the IOMP is. So I hit up the website, and uh, again, it wasn't terribly informative, but there was this little blurb. International Day of Medical Physics on November 7th is basically the day that Mary Curie was born uh, in Poland. As far as I know, Poland didn't exist at the time, but uh, it's interesting anyways. So we'll see Mary Curie pop up later, uh, but she does play a role in this. So we'll start right in the back history, right, way, not, not as far back as the Greeks as we went to, uh, for the ethics course, for the ethics lecture, but pretty far back. So we'll start with a familiar name. In 1830, Michael Faraday uh, was doing some work on electromagnetism. So uh, I'm sure you know the name. Uh, he was widely recognized as being instrumental in conceptualization of the electromagnetic field that we kind of take for granted these days. Um, he also established that magnetism could affect the rays of light and that the phenomena were somehow related. This would, of course, be uh, mixed into the kind of tumbler uh, with uh, Maxwell's equations and, and kind of the QM revolution down the line. But uh, a big chunk of it started here in 1830. Uh, it's worth pointing out that nobody knew of subatomic particles, or electrons, or photons at this time. Uh, I guess they had some kind of idea of what a photon was, but uh, the British kind of had this inherent idea, I think it was the British, maybe some Germans, that uh, light were corpuscles. And this corpuscle theory kept coming up for the next hundred years, uh, and, and even more. So the photon was known, but it doesn't, there wasn't really much known about it. So a less known name, in 1859, Julius Plucker. Uh, he was a German mathematician and physicist. He's mostly well known for his fundamental contributions to analytical geometry. Uh, despite working with a pen and paper, he also did experiments with cathode ray tubes. Quite important for medical physics. So uh, in 1859, he's doing an experiment with a cathode ray tube, and he notices that the passage of a high electron or high voltage current through a vacuum uh, produced an apple green fluorescence on the inner wall of the tube. Now this diagram shows the uh, the fluorescence happening within the tube, but it's really only this patch right here that fluoresces. It's only once it hits, once this invisible beam strikes the wall, that it fluoresces. This is important. Um, he then discovered that he could alter the position of the glowing patch by bringing a magnet close to the tube. So this is in 1859. Uh, he just invented the computer monitor. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so he considered this evidence that whatever produced the glow was electrically charged somehow. Strong hint. So this ultimately led to the discovery of the electron. Of course, it wasn't Julius Plucker that did it. It was many years later by J.J. Thompson, but we'll, we'll get there. But anyways, just imagine that you, you know that whatever is in there is electrically charged, but you don't know that electrically charged things exist. That blows my mind to think about it. Like, that's a tough day job every day, right? So let's jump forward um, about 20 years to Sir William Crookes. So just some personal bio in, uh, stuff that's interesting. He was the eldest son of 16. Um, he was a British chemist and physicist. He was involved in early spectroscopy. He himself personally discovered thallium uh, about 20, 15 years prior to this. He also was the, the person that discovered that plasma was a fourth state of matter. Um, so he was working with uh, Plucker's tubes, and he noticed that the the items had to be coming from the cathode. So he, he referred to these, uh, these things as cathode rays. Um, really most importantly is that he invented the Crookes tube. So here's a 1902 Vanity Fair caricature of him. Uh, you may believe scientists never really made it into the spotlight except for Einstein, but in fact you're wrong. In this, in this heyday, there were lots of scientists around. Uh, the Latin inscription here is Ubi Crookes, Ibi Lux, which translates to where there is crooks, there is light. So I find it really phenomenal that uh, not only were people paying attention to scientists, but they were actually paying attention to what, what specifically the scientists were doing. Uh, so certainly an exciting time. Also, this highlights that the crooks tube really is, uh, was crooks' fundamental contribution, I think, in my opinion. So here it is up close. 
Um, his actually did have the Maltese cross in it, this, this little item here, along with some modifications. This is a reproduction. So right here is the cathode, and here is the anode. There's a slight vacuum, um, not a complete vacuum. Uh, electricity flows from the cathode to the anode and lights up this, this sphere. This surface is the one that will glow. So here it is glowing. You can see this, this cross only exists to cast a shadow so that we, can, we know that whatever is casting the shadow is coming from the cathode. So that's how we know that those, those rays are cathode rays. Here it is with the magnet deflecting. Um, really cool. I think this is really awesome. So Crixus II was used by many important experiments. Um, lots. Uh, lots of really fundamentally important experiments. So the later discovery that cathode rays were particles, which were electrons, was instrumental for the next century of physics. And really more so if you think about the wave particle duality questions, quantum mechanics, um, the birth of plasma, and sort of uh, the next step in electromagnetic, uh, like the missing Maxwell term in the magnetic field. It's all sort of, you could argue, stems from, uh, from these sorts of experiments. Let's skip ahead another 20 years uh, to Philip Leonard. So he was a German physicist. He was really interested in what I, was, what I would consider really cool, difficult, intricate atomic questions like photoelectrics, phosphorescence, luminescence, and really this is one I would put on my business card, conductivity of flames. Like that's, come on, that's awesome. <laughs> Anyways, in case you didn't know, phosphorescence is uh, when a beam of incoming light uh, reacts somehow, is absorbed in a system, and then is re-emitted at another wavelength. Um, so there are a couple more bits of bio that I will withhold. You may be familiar with this fellow, uh, but we will judge him on his work first. So in 1893, he experimented with a modified Crookes tube. Now with this tube, he, uh, he took a, a chunk of the glass in kind of the bulb section, uh, the target section, and replaced it with aluminum, with the understanding that Whatever these rays were, he wanted them to pass through the aluminum instead of fluoresce the, the, the glass screen. Um, and in fact, this is what he did. Uh, it worked. The cathode rays passed through the aluminum window and into air. Now, he held things up other than glass to see that if they would fluoresce. And uh, lo and behold, they did. And also, you could expose uh, photographic film with it. However, he also noticed something really strange. Um, <clears throat> although the, the Maltese cross produced a shadow and blocked the rays, um, he could actually put his hand, and he, he actually physically did put his hand in what we now know to be a, a, like a, a x-ray uh, beam, but he put his hand in between and could still fluoresce objects on the other side, including glass. So this is really important. He knows that things aren't going around because things didn't go around the, the, the Maltese cross. Uh, so somehow he knows that they're penetrating through his hand and staying energetic. Another very uh, timely, timely result. He, he kind of he just about had it. He just about discovered uh, the important bit here, uh, but he didn't quite. He was beat by two years. Um, so we'll go back to his bio. Um, he was a little bit busy at the time, uh, actually a little bit down the road, but he ultimately received a Nobel Prize in 1905 for this work. A um, little less unsavory, a little less savory. He was an outspoken Nazi in the 20s before, it was, uh, before there was social pressure. In fact, you can maybe argue that he was one of the uh, instruments of spreading Nazism. Um, and then a whole list. He personally advised Hitler. He was made the chief of Aryan physics under the Nazis. He personally believed Einstein's relativity, relativity was, quote, Jewish fraud, and uh, disputed Einstein's photoelectric effect, which uh, is something that I think maybe he wished he had discovered himself, but didn't. So anyways, uh, judge him on his contributions to science, I, I would argue. Anyways, two years later, a, a name you've undoubtedly heard, Wilhelm Röntgen, uh, was a German physicist um, also. He was fascinated by the cathode ray tube experiments. Now, he ultimately won the first Nobel Prize in 1901, and therefore, uh, you could imagine, did better work somehow than Leonard. Um, he's also referred to as the father of diagnostic radiology. So presumably, the cat's out of the bag, and you know what I'm going to talk about now. Um, he's instrumental in x-rays, right? Uh, so... So in 1895, he decided to methodically test several of these timely cathode ray tube experiments. Now, I didn't talk about Heinrich Hertz, 
but I know you know him because he uses electricity every day. Uh, I, I introduced William Crooks, Nikola Tesla, uh, I know you've heard of him too, and Philip Leiter. There were a few other ones, but those are really the big guys in the uh, Crook tube experiments. And uh, Roken was really fascinated with them. Um, little minor variations that each one of them had, little clues. There was something really interesting here. Um, so I, I'm not kidding. Uh, essentially, all he did was modify Crookes' experiment by adding some cardboard and dimming the light in like a really MacGyverish style kind of uh, one-two. And uh, he noticed something interesting. Something was shimmering behind him from a nearby screen. Now he wouldn't have noticed the shimmering without the cardboard or the or the light. So it's interesting that he just kind of happened upon this. But anyways, he claims that he did. And uh, when he noticed this, he basically became obsessed with the effect. And when I say um, obsessed, I mean in, in his words, uh, oh sorry, not in his words, uh, uh, someone else's words rather. Roken speculated that a new kind of ray might be responsible. He noticed the shimmering on a Friday, so he took advantage of the weekend to repeat his experiments and make his first notes. Now here's where the obsession kicks in. Kicks in. In the following weeks, he ate and slept in his laboratory as he investigated many properties of the new rays he temporarily termed X-rays, using the mathematical designation for something unknown. So the X comes from just a variable, in case you didn't know. Just some guy doing an experiment on Friday that was just thought it was really cool, decided to sleep in his lab and continue to work on it. Uh, and this is the origin of the X-ray. With cardboard and dim lights. So uh, systematically irradiating things, he uh, then went you know, multiple different types of things, he inevitably tried lead, which was uh, easy to uh, refine at the time and plentiful. Um, so using it, he generated the first radiographic image, which was his, quote, own flickering ghostly skeleton on a nearby screen. So when he saw this, he claimed in his Nobel speech that he immediately decided to continue his experiments in secrecy, fearing for his professional reputation in case he had been wrong. With the, like all of a sudden there was this spooky ghost out of nowhere and he really thought, geez, I can't let anybody know what's up until I, until I have some kind of handle on this, right? So maybe you could consider this the obsession getting stronger and stronger. Anyways, uh, he did let his wife in on the, the secret and so shortly after his discovery, he took the famous x-ray picture of his wife's hand. Um, so there was a little bit of debate I've heard on and off about whether it really is his wife's hand or his hand. Uh, it is, in fact, his wife's hand, if that makes a difference. Um, but any guesses? So when she saw her skeleton, she yelled out something, in, in, like viscerally, immediately. Does anybody know what that was? Any guesses? Was it in German? No, no, it was in English. Well, it might have been in German, I don't know. She maybe melodramatically said, I have seen my own death. She, so she was absolutely stunned by this. Um, so here it is. I mean, you can imagine, you see those like uh, Hitchcock movies from the 60s. They're not really that scary, like birds, come on. Uh, but, you know, this doesn't really seem like she's seen her own death. Anyways, it's, re it's really cool. Um, this is the first radiographic image. And uh, people immediately started thinking, if I can see bone structure, I could use this for some medical medical things, right? Some medical applications. So uh, there's some really fascinating timing here and I, I don't have, uh, this would require a lot more lecture to get kind of in depth to really um, get to the core of the issue. But frankly, if I just, if I, if you watch like a television show and all these events kind of interplayed, you would never believe that they were real. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best to explain that and maybe, maybe you can get interested in it uh, and read about it on Wikipedia or something if you want to, but I'm sure you'll get the gist of it. So within two weeks of announcing his discovery, he is requested personally to give a demonstration to Kaiser Wilhelm II. So I don't expect that name to be familiar. Uh, just, just here's a little bit of a bio. The final, he was the final German emperor and king of Prussia. He was also the eldest grandson of Queen Victoria. Uh, and in case you're confused, he was not the fellow whose assassination sparked World War I. He was personally good friends with that individual. And that individual was Franz Ferdinand, who was the Archduke I believe of Prussia. Um, so same same location, good friends, not the guy that got murdered. Um, in fact, he was such good friends and he wanted to avoid war so much, the First World War, that he tried to use Franz Ferdinand's funeral as a means of peace, as like an impromptu 
peace conference, and it of course failed, and we ended up with World War I eventually. But mostly the important thing is that he enthusiastically and vigorously promoted the arts and sciences. There's a, a famous quip about Kaiser Wilhelm, and that's in 1913, he hosted a lavish wedding for his only daughter in Berlin. He invited all of his family, which is, of course, no, includes all the royalty around Europe at the time. Um, among the guests at the wedding were Tsar Nicholas II, who disliked him, to put it nicely, as did his English cousin, King, King George V, and his wife, Queen Mary. Um, so he's not really liked, but frankly, he did a lot for, for the arts and sciences uh, in Germany, especially at this, at this time, right before the war. So getting back to the story. Um, 1896, Röntgen makes this discovery. Two weeks later, he gives a demo to Röntgen. News travels fast. Uh, about 60 days after Röntgen's discovery, uh, there is a demonstration, not by Röntgen, like by word of mouth, at the French Academy of Sciences. Now remember, these cathode ray tubes were kind of hot news, uh, so I presume they had the equipment and it was just a word of mouth. Like there wasn't, somebody didn't get an email or something. Uh, nobody, nobody phoned, I don't think anyone even telegraphed. Somebody probably actually had to make the trip. Um, but anyways, 60 days later, two months, there's a demo with the French Academy of Science. And uh, wouldn't you know, Henry Becquerel happens to be in attendance. This is another important name. So let's, let's stop the, uh, the going forward in time just for a second and look at some parallel developments. I don't have time to really develop this arc as well. Uh, but we'll just go way back, almost to the beginning. So 1857, uh, uh, French photographic inventor by the name of, uh, I'm going to butcher it, I'm just going to call him Abel. So uh, he's a, a photographic inventor, just a generic inventor at the time, um, but photography had been around for a very long time, even at this point. He noticed that even in complete darkness, these specific salts, uh, uranium salts, could expose photographic emulsions. Now he of course didn't know that, I don't think he knew that there were uranium salts at the time, because uranium hadn't been discovered. but. Uh, he knew that something was weird. Uh, he recognized that this invisible light was neither phosphorescence nor fluorescence. So meaning, if he had a whole bunch of it stored in a cellar, and he took it out and put it maybe in another cellar room, and took some film and put it in the cellar, the, the film would mysteriously uh, develop. So it'd be exposed. Um, so he knew that there, there wasn't any sunlight in this process. Um, so he found these uranium salts could expose photographic plates also long after they were exposed to sunlight. Uh, so he knew that there was something, something in this uh, invisible light. Now, he never really made the, the, the uh, let's see, he never made the jump that the, there actually was some, something like radioactivity happening, but uh, he was very close. And in fact, uh, Henry Becquerel is in attendance at this and is thinking uh, about x-rays and, and radioactivity or the concept of these invisible lights and we know that uh, because Henry Becquerel's father actually wrote a textbook that included Abel's discovery. So this is how the X-ray and radio uh, radioactivity arc lines kind of come together. Um, they, they, there's these two meetings. Becquerel attends the French Academy of Sciences, and then Becquerel's father is also aware of, of uh, radioactive uranium salts, or these invisible lights. So uh, Becquerel's father did that. This is Becquerel himself. So in 1896, he's in attendance at this uh, French Academy demonstration. A little bit of a bio, he's a French physicist. Uh, for some strange reason that I can't tell, um, and it's not really discussed as being unnormal, but he's a chief engineer in the Department of Bridges and Highways, and I, I think Lyon, France, or something, which I find really strange. But anyways, um, his father discovered the photoelectric effect, and just as a sign of the times, his PhD thesis was on the polarization of light. So he's kind of limited, like circular, vertical, whatever. Um, so also he was interested in phosphorescence. In fact, he was mostly interested in phosphorescence. When he saw these Röntgen rays, he was thinking about how it could possibly be a uh, phosphorescence effect. Um, so following the demonstration of X-rays, Becquerel thought phosphorescent materials, such as uranium salts, might emit X-ray light X-ray-like radiation when illuminated by bright sunlight. So he did some experiments, and, and his experiments actually showed that it was right. So you can think of this, now that we, we know better, he was somehow exposing uranium to sunlight, 
and was surprised when the sunlight uh, or the, the uranium was emitting again. He took that as proof that the uranium salts were phosphorescent. So remember, his interests were in phosphorescence. This is the, the world view that he had. So one month later, one month after he sees the demo, he goes home, he does this demonstration, he comes back, and he presents to the French Academy of Sciences. Now, after another month of experimentation, he realizes that something just isn't right. Um, this is a, a quote. I will insist particularly upon the following fact, beyond the phenomena which one could expect to observe. Um, he says, the same crystalline crusts, uh, the uranium ones, arranged the same way with respect to the photographic plates, in the same conditions, and through the same screens, but sheltered from sunlight, basically, still produce the same photographic images. So he's, he's done these two experiments, and he's thinking about phosphorescence, and he realizes that if you remove the sun from the equation, it still phosphoresces. So you can imagine, he must have just banged his head on the wall trying to figure out what was happening. Like this is like the, the modern day equivalent of uh, you're debugging some code and you realize that like you come to the conclusion, you convince yourself that it's impossible that your code is doing what it's doing. And he spent a month trying to figure out what the issue is. So it slowly dawns on him. Um, after two more months of probably what I would call extreme frustration, he comes to the conclusion that the radiation is coming from the uranium. Not a, not a very big leap, but you know, kind of, uh, it, obviously it had to be coming from the uranium but uh, kind of an interesting thing to think that this particle, these particles somehow like, emit something on their own. Um, so with this, Becquerel actually discovered radioactivity. It's interesting to note that it took 114 days for the discovery of x-rays to spark the discovery of radioactivity. Um, but if you look at it the flip side, it took roughly 60 years for somebody to clue in that the uranium salts with their invisible light were emitting something. So it's either a really short time or a really long time. The following year, just to, to give you a timeline, J.J. Thompson finally discovers the electron. And J.J. Thompson is a really fascinating guy, so I figured I'd sneak a slide in. Um, so some other little uh, bio stuff. He actually invented the mass spectrometer. He won a Nobel Prize. He was the first to find evidence of isotopes in stable elements. That's, that's sort of a big one. Um, the elements were known, but isotopes were not. Uh, that was Mary Curie's kind of forte down the road. Uh, but there's some other interesting bit of trivia I wonder if anybody knows. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Joel, I know you know this. So he's known as the world's greatest teacher. He leads seven of his research assistants and his own son to Nobel Prizes. Well, what a fantastic teacher. Uh, so really, he had a, he had a knack. He made, his, he made his mark by teaching uh, so many of the, the great electromagneticists and quantum folk um, that really jump-started uh, kind of the quantum revolution. But uh, super fascinating guy. Okay, so one year later, two years after... Um, Becquerel's discovery of uh, radioactivity. Mary Curie uh, kind of comes on the scene. So she's a fiercely Polish and naturally uh, naturalized French chemist and physicist. Uh, some interesting points. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, uh, first woman to be, to be made a full professor at the University of Paris, and she, of course, eventually died of exposure, partially due to carrying radium in her pockets, her waistcoat pockets and pants pockets, and partially due to service in a mobile x-ray carts during World War I, which interestingly enough, she herself had designed in order to uh, set fractures and, and look at bones and, and so those sort of things. But she rode around these carts without any kind of protection, um, and that eventually did her in. So in 1898, uh, maybe a little bit before, she's sort of thinking about Röntgen's x-rays and Becquerel's radioactivity. Um, so she's influenced primarily by Becquerel's uranium salts, uh, to look at uranium rays as a possible field of research for her PhD thesis. Um, so during the course of her thesis, she investigates many materials, searching for this thing she calls radioactivity, um, which comes about, which she actually she coined from the, the actual radioactivity you could hear on a radio uh, when these sources are nearby, 
like a Geiger counter sort of deal. Um, so she, in the work of this, in the process, jointly discovered thorium's radioactivity, and then also discovered radium and polonium, the elements. Those were not known. So radium, um, she was obviously found, fond of the radioactivity, radium kind of prefix. But polonium, does anyone know what that's named after? No? It's named after Poland. She's fiercely Polish. Now the interesting thing is that Frederick the Great from Prussia had partitioned Poland into four a hundred years prior. So the Poland that she named Polonium after was a country that she had never seen. The country never existed in her lifetime. So she was somehow like a... Um, what's it called? She was hopeful that Poland would, of course, eventually return. And it did. Uh, I, think, I think right now this is the Ukraine, uh, which is in danger of, uh, of course, reoccupation like it always has been. Like here it's under Poland's control, and then it's Ukraine's, uh, Russia's. And then up here, uh, there's two countries, I can't remember their name, but this is, this is modern-day Poland right here. So uh, a shell of its former pre-1772 size. But anyways, that's, uh, she, she was, she was uh, adamant about maintaining her Polish heritage, as I think lots of Polish people were at the time. So back to the, the story arc. Um, the publication of her PhD research and other research ignited widespread interest among scientists who sought to better understand the properties and potential of radioactivity. And some pretty big names got jumped on board after, after her research was disseminated, in, including Thomas Edison, Max Planck, Nikola Tesla, and so many more down the line. Uh, we've all seen pictures, sorry, I forgot to include it, of like the Solvay Convention, where she's with Bohr and Einstein and uh, Planck and uh, countless other people discussing like the future of physics that, that, as we know it. So she really is a, a pioneer uh, in, in medical physics and actual modern physics too. Um, yeah, I could really go on and on about her, but I don't have all that much time. So the race is on at this point. Uh, this is a talk about medical physics. We know x-rays have been discovered. We know radioactivity have been discovered. Right, so we've got Linux and brachytherapy ready to go, essentially. Not quite. In fact, not at all. But the, the, the tools are there, you know. Um, who will be the first to treat a patient? Who do you think? So I'll give you a couple clues. Like, we can play like a detective game here. So in 1900, a couple years after Curry, a couple years after Becquerel and Ronkin, um, there is unbelievably still no consensus on what the cause of tissue damage was when handling x-ray tubes, right? So people were walking around with x-ray tubes in their hands and in pockets, and oh, lo and behold, they were getting tissue damage. Whatever could be the cause of this tissue, da tissue damage. Um, so this fellow named Kindbuck does some experiments with rats, and finally conclusively demonstrates that only x-rays could be responsible, as if it could be any other thing coming from these x-ray tubes. I just, this is such like a scientist moment, right? Like, of course it was x-rays, they were carrying x-ray tubes. So anyways, uh, in 1900, it's well known that x-rays cause tissue damage. In 1901, Becquerel accidentally receives a severe skin burn after carrying a vial of radium in his waistcoat pocket. Now, not just a small burn, a severe burn. Mary Curry describes uh, at least one similar burn, I think probably more, uh, until she eventually died of that sort of thing. Uh, but it's understood that, at, in 1901 at least, with certainty, it's understood that uh, a vial of radium can cause severe tissue damage. So cell death, regionalized cell death, because Becquerel himself didn't die. Um, but 1901. In 1902, Mary Curry announces that when exposed to radium, Specifically, diseased tumor-forming cells were destroyed faster than healthy cells, right? So she must be thinking about it at this point. Um, it is finally shown that x-rays affect cellular phagocytosis or other physiological processes. So we know with certainty that people are experimenting with x-rays and radium and human tissues, specifically cancerous tissues. This is 1902. So anyone have any guesses? I mean, there, there's some big names. Mary Curry keeps coming up, Becquerel, Ronkin. Um, I'll give you a hint. 
It's between 1896 and 1902, between all these events. Anyone have any clues? Hints? Guesses? Nobody's going to say Mary Curry? <laughs> After all that? <laughs> okay. Uh, so the, this is a trick question. I think you guys all did a good job. Excellent. Uh, so the answer is that we don't know. The details are fuzzy. Uh, just about as fuzzy as this picture of Emil Grubb. So if you don't know, Emil Grubb was vocal and explicit about claiming he irradiated two patients in 1896, the exact same year that Becquerel announced x-rays. In fact, something like, uh, I think it was 100 days or less after, afterward, which would have been phenomenal because he was a medical student in America. Uh, he was a second-year medical student who also claimed to manufacture various bulbs, like Crooks bulbs, uh, light bulbs, and that sort of thing. Um, there was a couple plot holes, or whole inconsistencies, rather, with his theory. Uh, first one, the biggest one, is that he waited over 30 years to make a claim that he was the one that did this at this time period. Um, he also had a conflicting account of the established events, including when Becquerel made his presentation to the French Academy, um, and other inconsistencies, like he claimed to be a manufacturer of light bulbs when, in fact, it came to light that he probably just manufactured a business card. That was the sole evidence that we had that he was the manufacturer of bulbs. So uh, the, biggest, the biggest issue is that actually he kind of said, well, I didn't do it in his will. But it's more fun if you look at the clues while he was still alive. Um, but uh, what is established is that he's probably the first American to, to irradiate a patient. So I won't spend much time on him. But it is most likely that this uh, French... Victor, I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name, fellow, um, was the first. So in fact, he was a hygienist from France. Uh, at one point, he was the head of the Faculty of Medicine in Lyon, France. Uh, so no, no physics training, uh, that, not that I know of, uh, no kind of uh, mathematical inclivity. Um, hygienist. Interesting. So he was known for assessing the quality of tap water and trying to find a cure for tuberculosis. This is the fellow but first tried to apply radiation to uh, treatment of cancer. In this case, it was a stomach cancer. And uh, lo and behold, uh, when he irradiated the tumor, uh, this was the, the inner mark was the uh, palpated extent of the tumor on the patient's stomach. And then after he irradiated, it of course had gone bigger. There was no skin damage. Um, essentially, he shot a bright light at this poor fellow. Um, he died a week later. It was a terrible failure, and it is possibly the first medical physics treatment. It was just a total flaw. I find that kind of uh, anticlimactic, but there we go. So, uh, maybe a bit more satisfying the story. Whoever it was, uh, we know that shortly after Becquerel and Recurry uh, reported their burns, they actually sent radioactive materials to St. Louis Hospital in Paris. So, whoever was first... It was very quick to get into the hospitals, and, and uh, uh, dermatologists specifically started really quickly thinking about how they could use it. So this really initiated radium therapy. Um, you could consider Becquerel and Curry, I think, I think it would be fair to uh, just consider them kind of the, the first, more or less. Um, the first clinical use of the new radiation was actually undertaken by a dermatologist. And you may think, what? A dermatologist? Why would a dermatologist want to use uh, radiation for anything? Uh, well, well, you have to kind of think about the time frame that you're in. Antibiotics uh, only became available 40 years later, during World War II. We're not even at World War I yet. Um, radiation therapy was initially widely prescribed for skin lesions and chronic inflammatory diseases. I mean, we didn't just have antibiotics to throw at these people. Um, surgery often failed and people became infected. Um, Honestly, tuberculosis was a widespread disease and a, you know, a, huge, a huge issue at the time. Cancer was very small. Um, so uh, skin lesions and that sort of thing that were very visible um, were obvious. So it was obvious to, to the, that this could be used to, skin, uh, sorry, to treat skin burn uh, inflammations and that sort of thing because uh, you, know, you, could see, you could see the outer layer of the skin. So... Uh, other issues is that there was no, mean, no means of 3D planning. You couldn't really direct a beam or see inside a patient. Um, uh, inconsistent radioactivity between suppliers and, and samples. X-ray energies and luminosity were awful. 
Um, at one point, um, physicians, in order to test the quality of their beam, would stick their hand in the beam every, every day, every so, so many hours, just to make sure that the beam was still strong enough to pass through their hand. And so you can imagine that many of them had, you know, died handless or of cancer. Um, so there, this was partially known. You know, people were getting burns on their hands at the time. But really the biggest issue was that it was hard to see tumors without surgery. We didn't have any sort of modern imaging. And uh, if you're going to open up a patient to look at the tumor, you might as well just cut it out of them while you've got them open, right? So I've talked about the kind of prehistory of medical physics. I'll do a little bit on medical physics between 1905 and 1920. So this is a real transition period. Um, just to kind of get you in the, in the in, like when I say 1907, nobody really knows what that means because none of us were alive then. Um, let's see if I can. This is a video from uh, Vancouver in 1907. So this is by some fellow that came by with a video camera who was riding the trolleys in 1907. Um, William Harbeck. And in fact, he died five years after filming this on the Titanic. Which is, I just, I think that's incredible. You know, like, you don't think about 1907 as being Titanic kind of era. It certainly was, and this poor fellow died. So anyways, this is, Van this is downtown Vancouver uh, in 1907. So of course, no cars. Cars and automobiles were around at the time, uh, but there was no kind of uh, Model Ts, no Fords, you know, horses, uh, dung on the road. Uh, you can see that there are tracks for trolleys. In fact, he's riding a trolley. Uh, and the people are, some of them are aware that they're being filmed. Occasionally, you can see one of them wave, uh, but of course, uh, lenses weren't very good, so the camera's very far focused. So people near to the camera wouldn't, if they did wave, they wouldn't be seen, okay? Um, of course, there's no sort of crosswalks or pavement. Um, there are telephone and power lines. Of course, this is right downtown. I've been told that you can recognize some streets. I personally, I can't. Um, the attire, the top hats, bicycles. It's phenomenal. So I'll skip ahead. Uh, so there are some things that are really old-fashioned about this, but uh, some things that are really not. I, I think somebody told me this is going down Carisdale, and uh, if you look closely, these, uh, these so-called Vancouver special houses, this architecture is still around today. Some of these houses are still standing. Uh, and in fact, this just looks like grainy and old-fashioned. Uh, film of, of today, if you just took a quick glance at it, um, in my opinion. So this is, this is what life was like in Canada at this time, 1907. So let's get back to the, the story arc. Cancers were not priority illnesses, like I said. Uh, tuberculosis was really a big thing. In fact, that led to some interesting uh, algorithmic and computational uh, Mathematics and population ep epidemics, I guess. Epigenetics and epidemic studies. Uh, but anyways, that's not, not here nor there. Uh, so radiation treatment success at, in the early days was really bad. 5% or so. Uh, so, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, almost. Radium, specifically, was highly experimental. It was kind of this new thing on the scene. And radiation treatment often was used for skin lesions and inflammations. Uh, not really for deep, deep cancerous things. If you got a deep cancerous thing, um, y you know, you were just happy not to have got tuberculosis or syphilis or something. Uh, some early machinery, uh, so some x-ray apparatus. This is before 1905, before 1904. Uh, but you can see this giant coil. Uh, this looks like a Crips tube to me. And then some other apparatus here. I, I don't know if this is the battery or if this is the battery, honestly. Um, either way, you know. Very old-fashioned. You can see that when they did treat patients, uh, this is in 1908, it looked extremely uncomfortable, like, like the sort of thing that you'd have nightmares about getting teeth pulled. 
This is uh, particularly astonishing to me. This is a radioactive corkscrew, which is a primitive form of interstitial treatment. Uh, it was filled with radioactive material and then, quote, bored into the tissues, which, I, you know, I'll just die of cancer, thank you very much. <laughs> I certainly, I'm certain that this wasn't sterilized either. You know, they're just like, well, hold on, we're going to start boring. So let's go back to the uh, the story arc here. We're, whoever was first, we know that shortly after Becquerel and Curry reported their burn experiences, they sent these materials to the St. Louis Hospital. Um, so let's talk about shortcomings. Why do they have to send anything to the hospital? Um, so between 1890 and 1920, there was this transition period where doctors stopped going to people's houses. And in fact, the patients started coming to hospitals. Um, early hospitals did not have electrical current. Uh, and so there's, this is anecdote. There's this uh, famous French physician who's the father of radiology, which is a, a term that he coined. But he used to transport batteries by carriage each day back and forth between the hospital. And I guess while he was working at the hospital, I think his wife was busy charging the batteries for the next day. So he would always have a fresh supply of batteries. Uh, so it was really, really a problem. As I mentioned, the early x-ray tubes were poor. They were limited by supply. So at maximum, uh, they reached 50 to 100 kbp and maybe 1 milliamp. So that's like, that's, I think that's almost like bad imaging quality, uh, let alone trying to treat somebody with that. So treatment times were thus unbearably long. Uh, so this is really a problem because patients fidgeted, of course, if you have to deliver a treatment over an hour, uh, but also because... We didn't have things like couches for them to lay on, or even comfy chairs in most cases. In some cases, the, uh, the treatment arrangement was absolutely intolerable. And I mean, literally intolerable. Like, could you hold this pose for two hours? I certainly couldn't. It's a treatment for carcinoma of, of the cervix. But there's all sorts of weird diagrams, and, and like, it, 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 this would easily pass off as like a torture, uh, history of torture manual or something. So really, patients were not really fond of cancer treatment in the early days. Um, to make things worse, 200 kvp tubes were not available until the 1920s. So x-rays were not really useful for treating most cancers. So we, we had brachy, and that was it. Um, make, making things much worse, artificially created isotopes were not available until the 30s. Uh, so radium was extremely important. Radium was our only line of defense against cancer. Uh, more or less. Brachytherapy was essentially the only option. So these, these uh, clever people coming up with clever designs, they placed radium in needles, tubes, and corkscrews. Uh, eventually somebody thought, hey, why don't we stick, uh, you know, instead of all these bulky corkscrews we're going to torque into a person, uh, why don't we put uh, radon gas in little gold seeds? Um, which is uh, something that I understand still happens today with brachy seeds. Anyways, uh, that was kind of around this time that those were being uh, invented. Uh, but really, the biggest issue was that administration of radiation was haphazard, and lots of physicians and physicists died. Thomas Edison has a famous incident uh, where he nearly blinded himself and almost killed his research assistant. Although I'm sure he killed other research assistants because he was kind of known for like his excellent treatment of research assistants. Uh, but the, really, the core issue was that radi radium was really expensive, and it was really rare. Sorry, this is a wall of text, but it just has so many things come together, I had to put it up. Uh, so it's a, a fellow in 1925 talking about uh, 20 years since Madame Curie announced to the Academy of Sciences uh, this pitch blend and chalcolite light are radioactive. Um, so pitch blend was supplied by a single person in Bohemia. Um, he, he was the one that provided these uranium salts for everyone in the world. So uh, uh, let's see. Becquerel's and, and the, the, the Abel character before him got their uranium salts from this one supplier in one part of the world, and that was it. Um, so it turns out that this pitch, uh, pitch blend was needed to get these uranium salts. Um, and uh, around the, the turn of the First War, because Aust it was, this, this was in Austria, and Austria was heavily involved in the war, uh, the Austrian government decided that they were going to seize exportation of the, of the, of the mine and have a monopoly on radium, so they weren't going to export it. You know, they were going to use this to their advantage. Um, and everywhere in the, around the world really felt that. Until about 1913. 
So American plants got into operation and they produced 10.5 grams. Like, woo, 10.5 grams, wow. Uh, and then 22.4 grams the following year. Um, so it, it continued uh, over the course of the First World War. And then it came, to, it, this, this fellow mentions that it was necessary to treat 400 tons of, the, of this mineral to get one gram of radium. So that's an awful lot of refining, right? Um, Madame Curie actually discovered this in her thesis which took a chunk of this uh, carnitite, stuck it in a, 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 what is it, a pestle, mortar and pestle, and started grinding it up, when she quickly realized that she would have to do this for like 400 tons to get a, 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 a gram of uh, material. He goes on to say that it was estimated that in, in the entire world there were 300 grams of radium. 300 grams of radium. In the U.S., around the 20s, uh, there are 120 grams. So all of the world has this shortage, and uh, we're talking grams here. So uh, just going to wrap things up. Uh, pretty short. I don't really have a whole, a whole lot of time to go on, but take quickly look at France and then Canada, and then just wrap things up. So uh, France was really instrumental at the beginning. Uh, they were involved in the French Academy of Sciences, of course. Um, this Victor fellow was, was, as we know, the first to treat a patient we think. And then the Curries were, of course, in France. Uh, so there's this really this, this big uh, kind of tumbler of things happening in France in the early, in the early days. Um, they were really active until they were occupied in 1914 during the First World War, and then it just ground to a halt. But as a testament to uh, kind of the pioneering work, uh, it turns out that 61 out of 163 of the victims of ionizing, ionizing radiation listed at the Hamburg Memorial are either physicists or physicians involved with the emerging field. Uh, so quite a few of them died doing this. Uh, still, there's this uh, funny thing that happens still to this day. Uh, the physicians that were willing to treat um, were limited by litigation and French law. Uh, there's a quote there I won't read, but uh, a few radiologists were sued and the rest of them were uh, too scared to continue. You know because they made their means being doctors and then would be totally shut out of the field, which is insane. Um, so I'll skip the UK, America, and the Netherlands and all sorts of other countries. The US really does play a big role here. Um, I'll, I'll talk about Canada quickly. I've got, I think, one and a half slides. So Canada was initially hesitant to jump on the radium therapy bandwagon. When I first read this, I was shocked. I, I always had thought, I heard that Canada was a big player in early radiotherapy, um, and medical physics. Uh, it turns out that Canadian doctors had widespread belief that it would be ineffective. Um, they believed that radium would never displace surgery. In fact, uh, there's an article in the Canadian Practitioner in the early days, I think it was around the 20s, uh, that expressed disbelief that radium could be used at all, or used for all cancers, claiming to think so would be ridiculous, in their words. Like, damn it, Canada! What are you doing? <laughs> Saskatoon Daily Star. I've always, I was always under the impression that Saskatoon was a pioneer at the beginning. The Saskatoon Daily Star had an editorial written, I believe, by a doctor. I don't know where. I, I assume it was in the Saskatoon Hospital. They said, radium is a plaything, a bauble that puts hope in the minds of cancer sufferers and that this technology would provide a magical cure. So there's a wholesale writing off. We don't need this. It's trash. In fact, one doctor was quoted as saying um, that, because from his perspective, it was originating from the U.S., um, they, they believed that it was sort of this thing that the U.S. was peddling to, to make money. That they believed that the U.S. being uh, private, they just wanted to sell whatever they could, you know. Um, I think there's still a little bit of that sentiment today among some, some students, but anyways. Uh, so... The question is, are we strong finishers, or did we completely miss the boat here? The answer is, sorry, you'll have to wait for part two. Uh, I don't have time to cover it. Um, so I, you know, I didn't actually really talk too much about medical physics here, but I think I've, I've set the stage. Um, there is a hint. Things really do pick up after World War II. So things kind of get worse before World War I. World War II, we come out just... Just not, not just Canada, but the world really picks up. Everything gets better. So to summarize, 
Um, there are lots of fundamental discoveries, um, many famous physicists involved, uh, many uh, early honorary medical physicists, I would consider them. Um, there's also this domino effect and interplay between the actors, like Röntgen influencing Becquerel, influencing Curry, influencing down the line, down the line. Um, I guess like the ideas that they had were really infectious in a good way, um, really led to a lot of good discoveries. So early practices seem absolutely barbaric to us now, especially the corkscrew, and I would actually claim that is barbaric, but anyways, tuberculosis was a worse threat, and considered in the context with like the uh, metal working knowledge and, and that you know available materials, they really did the best they could with what they had. The main point is that there are really too many details to cover in reasonable detail, uh, certainly not inclusive of all that we would consider medical physics. I just wanted to sneak this in somewhere. This is a, a device of one of Hippocrates' followers uh, for measuring internal temperature. So they would drape this cloth in uh, potter's earth and then let it sit at room temperature. They would slap it on somebody's back and you can you see where it started cooling or drying the fastest was where the body temperature was the hottest. So I would definitely consider this kind of a, a medical physics, uh, physics sort of device, uh, but it's not really what we traditionally call medical physics. Anyways, there's a wider world out there. So there are my references. And if anyone's interested in giving a talk, there's lots of topics to cover. Uh, Nevin will be giving a talk on QA uh, at the end of the month. That's it. Any questions? I think I kind of went over time. Sorry.